So good morning everybody and many thanks for joining us on this morning's webinar on Benefit in Kind. Um, just before we get going, I just want to do a quick sound check with you. Um, over to the right of the screen, you should see a control panel and there you will see the um, option just to type in questions there. Um, if you can hear, okay, if you just want to type a Y or a yes in your question box there, we can just see that everything is okay before we get going. Okay, so we have a few yeses coming through there now. Um, so we will get we'll just we'll get started now. Um, just to um, introduce myself, I'm Vicky Clark, and I have my colleague Audrey Mooney here with me. Um, Audrey will be doing the main presentation just in a couple of minutes. Um, just to run through there. Um, the format of the webinar with you. So uh, what you should be able to see on your screen is our introduction slide. Um, so today's um, webinar will be in PowerPoint format there. As mentioned, you do have your control panel. So as Audrey is going through the presentation and talking away, if you do have any questions on any of the topics that will be covered, simply use that question box there on the right hand side. And what we'll do at the end of the session is just run through any questions you have. Um, and answer them for you there. Um, the session today is being recorded and what we will do at the end of the webinar, it's usually ready in the afternoon, possibly tomorrow morning, it just depends how quickly we can get that recording together for you, but we will send that recording on to you as well as a copy of the, the presentation slides as well. So it just makes it a little bit easier for you, you don't have to be scribbling away and making notes throughout the presentation there. Okay. So just on screen now is the agenda for this morning. Um, so you can see there that there's a good few topics to, to get through. Um, so what I will do, I'll hand you over to my colleague Audrey and she will take over now and yeah, she'll begin the pre presentation with you. Thanks Vicky. Um, good morning everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, okay, so a bit to get through today just on benefit and kind. Um, so firstly, just an introduction to Benefit and Kind. Um, so a Benefit and Kind exists when an employee. Sorry, just bear with me just for one second. Sorry, my screen is. Sorry, apologies there, I just couldn't see all of my screen. Uh, hopefully that's the technical difficulties over with for today. Um, so yeah, a benefit in kind exists when an employee receives a benefit from an employer in a form other than a monetary payment. So for any monetary payments, um, you know, they go through the payroll as a, you know, subject to tax, USC and PRSI. So a benefit in kind is for um, a benefit which is not in the in form of a monetary payment. So notional pay is a term used to describe the value of the benefit in kind. So for an employee, a benefit in kind is taxable if their total remuneration inclusive of the benefit in kind is €1,905 or more in a tax year. So once the uh, combined figure is more than €1,905, uh, the, you know, the benefit would be subject to benefit in kind. For a director, the benefits are taxable regardless of the level of remuneration. So all benefits for directors are taxable, or taxable benefit in kind. <coughs> so just to speak then about the most common benefit in kinds. Um, so the most common benefit in kinds provided by employers to employees, which are subject to PAY, PSI, and USC, are company vehicles, so company cars, stroke vans, um, medical insurance, loans whereby they're given at a reduced rate of interest or free of interest, and these loans are known as preferential, sorry, preferential loan, um, and free or subsidized accommodation. There are other ones, but they're the four, I suppose, most common ones. Um, PAYE, PRSI, and USC due on benefits must be collected by the employer through the operation of PAYE on the taxable value of the benefit. So it is the employer's responsibility to collect those taxes on the benefit and kind. The majority of items given by employers are either taxable or subject to benefit and kind. So today we will also cover some exempt benefits and payments that can be made tax free. Okay. 
So just to talk then, I suppose, about the treatment of benefit and kind. Um, so the value of the benefit should be treated as notional pay. In the pay period, the benefit is provided to the employee if the employer pays for the benefit in one payment. So for example, if it's medical insurance, um, the employer receives a bill and they pay that um, premium in one payment, then the revenue rule is that the employee should pay the benefit and kind in one pay period. If an employer pays for the benefit in installments, then the benefit is treated as notional pay and it is paid by the employer. So in other words, you would be spreading the benefit and kind over the year in the same way the employer is spreading the payments to the provider. Um, most benefit and kinds are subject to PAYE, PRSI for both the employee and the employer, and USC. The value of the benefit and kind, or in other words, notional pay as it's uh, referred to, is added to the employee's gross pay and PAYE, PRSI and USC is calculated on the combined figure, so that's the pay inclusive of their notional pay. So just to speak then about the benefit and kind rules, um, so PAYE, PRSI and USC due on the benefits, as we said, must be collected by the employer through deduction from payroll. So the notional pay must be the value of the benefit or best estimate, this is where the precise value is not known. Okay. Um, so for most benefits, the, you know, the precise value is very clear and it's, um, you know, it, it's easily accessible, you know, that figure. Um, but where the precise value is not known, then you would use best, est best estimate. Now, where the amount of wages or salary payable to an employee is insufficient to collect the full amount of the liabilities due in the notional pay, the employer is required to pay any shortfall. Okay? Um, so it's not enough to say that the employee didn't have enough pay to cover um, the taxes due in the notional pay. It is the employer's responsibility to pay over the short shortfall. Um, the employer would then recover any amount owed by the employee. <coughs> any shortfall of PAYE and USC paid by the employer and not repaid by the 31st of March of the following tax year would be an additional benefit in kind for the employee in the following tax year. So that means um, if there isn't enough, as we said, um, of a payment to cover the taxes on the notional pay, the employer pays over the shortfall. And provided that um, money is recovered from the employee by the 31st of March in the following tax year, there's no benefit in kind on that, if you like, a loan. Because um, other, other, any, sorry, other, under any other circumstances, um, a loan given by an employer would be subject to benefit in kind. Okay, so this is the only circumstances where um, the loan wouldn't be. And that's where it's to cover taxes, um, and it has to be repaid by the 31st of March in the following tax year. Okay, so if that money has not been repaid by the 31st of March in the following tax year, it does go through as a, you know, a subsequent benefit. Okay. Okay, so just for the valuation of the benefit. Um, the, the rules for the valuation of the benefit of kind vary depending on the nature of the benefit, benefit, sorry, benefit provided. Um, if the employer pays a bill, for example, a, a, you know, a club subscription, it could be you know, a gym membership, etc., the value is the cost incurred by the employer. Okay, where an employer provides goods to an employee, the value of the benefit in kind is the cost of providing the goods. And for this, revenue will accept the higher of the cost of the goods to the employer or the value realizable by the employee for the benefit, that is, the market value. Um, there are specific rules for certain benefits, for example, company vehicles, um, which we will cover just very shortly. Okay. So where an employer supplies an employee with a company car, which may be used for private use, the employee is chargeable to PAYE, USC and PRSI in respect of that use. Um, travel to and from work is considered to be private use, so that's not um, business, my, business journeys. Um, and the cash <coughs> equivalent is determined by applying a percentage, and this percentage is based on the business kilometres um, that the employee does, to the original market value of the vehicle supplied. If an employee makes a contribution towards the running cost of the car, the value of the benefit in kind will be reduced, but the contribution must be made directly to the employer. Um, 
So if, for example, the employee pays for the fuel in the car, but they're paying that money directly to the garage, um, that doesn't reduce down the benefit of clients. It's essential that the contribution has to be made directly to the employer. The most common way for that to happen would be a deduction from their payroll. It's the easiest option. Okay. Where a company provides pool cars for its employees, no benefit in kind charge arises. Now, in order to qualify for the pool car exemption, certain conditions must be met. Um, the car made available, uh, the car sorry, must be made available to and used by more than one employee. They're not ordinarily used by one employee to the exclusion of others. Um, and any private use of the car is merely incidental <coughs> to business use and it's not normally kept overnight at the home of any of its employees. All of those conditions must be met um, and for that reason it's unlikely that many company cars would qualify for the, the pool car exemption. So the you know, car pool or pool exemption is extremely um, unusual you know, because all of those conditions must be met. Okay. <clears throat> so a car is a mechanically propelled road vehicle designed, constructed or adapted for the carriage of the driver or the driver and one or more other persons other than a motorcycle weighing less than 410 kilograms or a van which we will look at um, next or a vehicle not commonly used as a pri private vehicle and unsuitable to be used so. So this includes all cars within the ordinary meaning of the word, uh, crew cabs and jeeps but excludes hearses and lorries. Okay? Um, so that's just the definition of company cars when it comes to um, benefit and kind. So the rate of benefit and kind then for company cars. Um, the notional value of a benefit and kind for the private use of a company car is 30% of the original market value of the car. Where the annual business travel exceeds certain thresholds, as set out in the table, um, I hope you can see that there, the rates decrease um, to 24%, 18%, 12%, and 6%. Um, so you can see in the table there, the higher the business travel you do, the lower the benefit and kind charge will be. Um, so really, I suppose, the more business mileage that you do, the, I suppose the, the less painful uh, the benefit and kind on a, vehicle, on a company car is. In the case of certain employees whose annual business travel does not exceed 24,000 kilometers, the rate may be reduced to 24%. So they would ordinarily be in the 30% threshold, um, but revenue allow for them to be, um, for their benefit and kind to be 24%. But the alternative basis is available where you know, the, the con certain conditions are met. So the employee works an average of not less than 20 hours per week travels at least 8,000 business kilometers per annum on the employer's business, spends at least 70% of his or her working time away from the employer's premises, and retains a logbook, sorry, a logbook detailing business kilometers, um, business, transa business transacted, business time travel, the date of the journey, etc. Um, and the logbook must be verified by the employer as being correct. Um, so there's, again, a lot of uh, different conditions there whereby that 30% rate can be reduced to 24%, um, and they must be met, met, you know, if you've got a revenue audit, um, you know, you have to be seen to be um, I suppose abiding by the rules. Um, employers should retain records to justify any reduction in the rate of BIK on a company car below 30% of the original market value. So revenue would deem everybody to be in the 30% rate until you prove otherwise. So until you have proof that you know your your business kilometers um, are such that you you know can then pay at the lower rates. Okay. So company vans then, um, so a van is a mechanically propelled vehicle which is designed or constructed solely or mainly for the carriage of goods or other burden, has a roofed area or areas to the, rear, to the rear of the driver's seat and has no side windows or seating fitted in that roofed area or areas, has a gross vehicle weight not exceeding 3,500 kilograms, and where a vehicle meets all of these criteria, it is regarded as a van rather than a car for the purposes of benefit and kind. No benefit and kind if the van's gross laden weight um, is more than 3,500 kilograms. Okay. 
Okay, so the notional value of a benefit kind on the private use of a company van is 5% of the original market value of the van. So you can see it's drastically different to a car, whereby you could be paying a 30%. Um, so with a van, it is a flat 5%. So the original market value of the van is calculated in the same manner as it is for cars. That is the retail selling price of a single vehicle in the state, inclusive of VAT and VRT. Um, so it's not necessarily always what you paid for the vehicle because, for example, if you were buying in bulk and you got a bulk discount, um, you know, that's not the value that you can use, unfortunately. It is the, um, you know, the single vehicle selling price at the time. Again, the benefit of kind is reduced by any contribution made by the employee um, towards the running costs of the van. As always, this con sorry, contribution must be paid directly to the employer. Um, Unlike cars, there is no reduction in the value of benefit and kind based on the annual business travel. So as I said, it's a flat 5%. It's actually a much easier calculation than it is, you know, than, than the cars. Um, there's no mileage table or anything, you know, it's a flat 5%. So just to look then at motorcycles, um, so a motorcycle or a motorbike is a vehicle with less than four wheels and the weight can, does not exceed 410 kilograms. There's a lot of weights here. <laughs> I don't think anyone is expected to remember them, um, but they are important. <laughs> um, the notional value of the benefit of kind on the private use of a motorcycle is 5% of the market value. Now what's different here is the market value is um, deemed to be when it was first provided by the employer to that or any other employee. So for example, a new employee comes in today, but there's a motorcycle there that um, you know, maybe was provided to an employee a year ago. It's the market value at the time that it was first provided to an employee in the company. So it's not the original market value, so a little bit different there for the bikes. Um, but also on top of that, you have to consider or take into account any other um, annual expenses. So it's the market value when it was first provided, plus other annual expenses, for example, insurance, tax, fuel, etc. Again, the benefit of kind is reduced by any contribution made by the employee towards the running costs. And I know I keep saying this, but I have to emphasize that the contribution must be paid directly to the employer. For motorcycles weighing more than 410 kilograms, they fall within the definition of a car for benefit and kind purposes, and the taxable value must be calculated on the same basis as a car. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so just to look then at fuel cards. Um, if an employee drives a company car and they're provided with a fuel card, then there is no benefit in kind provided it's only used to purchase fuel for the employee's company car. The benefit in kind on the car already covers the cost of the fuel. Okay, so when it's an employee driving a company car and provided with a fuel car, there is no benefit in kind. If an employee is given a fuel car and they drive a private car, the full amount is subject to benefit in kind where there is no business mileage. It's an employee with a private car provided with a fuel card. If there is no business mileage, then the full amount of the fuel card is subject to a benefit in kind. For employees then that drive their private car for business journeys, if the amount spent on the fuel card is less than or equal to the amount the employer could have paid in civil service travel rates in respect of the business travel, then there would be no benefit in kind. Um, and with everything I suppose to do with um, benefits and especially company vehicles or anything to do with vehicles or fuel or benefits, um, records should be kept um, verifying the business travel. Okay, so there should be a reference to the, the date of the journey, you know, the, you know, where the journey was, it was from and to, um, the purpose of the journey, etc. So there should always be documentation behind um, business travel. Okay, um, so just to look then at reimbursed expenses for business journeys. So employers can reimburse employees in respect of the cost of business journeys. And business journeys are from one place of work to another place of work. We mentioned earlier on, journeys from an employee's home to place of work are not business journeys. Okay, so that's private, um, they're private, deemed to be private journeys. So employers can reimburse employees by way of a flat rate kilometric allowance and the payment is non-taxable provided the rate paid does not exceed the civil service rates. So 
So you can see in the table there um, the civil service rates. So they're currently set there since the 5th of March 2009. Um, so the bigger the engine of your car, the more you're allowed to pay um, per kilometre. Um, and once you go over the 6,438 kilometres, the amount that you're allowed to pay to an employee in respect of business journeys, um, you know, considerably drops. So you can see there, um, for an engine size of 1,500 or more, for the first 6,437 kilometres, an employer can pay up to 59.07 cents per kilometre. But once the threshold of 6,437 has been uh, crossed, then the maximum they can pay, which is tax-free, is 28.46 cents per kilometre. Employers don't have to pay uh, the civil service rates, but you can't pay anything higher than that and have it um, as a non-taxable payment. Okay. Um, some employers then pay a car allowance, so um, perhaps an employee might be offered a choice of a company vehicle or a car allowance. Um, so a car allowance, you know, it's a, it's a flat payment made to the employee and it's liable to PAY, USC and PRSI. It's, a, it's an extra form of income. Okay. Okay, so just to look then at medical insurance, um, so a benefit of kind arises when an employer pays any part or all of an employee's medical insurance premium. So PAYE, PRSI and USC is chargeable on the value of the benefit. The benefit of kind is on the gross invoice premium before the tax relief at source has been deducted and the employer must refund the tax relief at source to revenue. Okay, so although they're only receiving a premium for the, sorry, apologies, an invoice for the net premium, um, they do need to refund the tax relief at source to revenue. The tax relief on medical insurance premiums is limited to €1,000 on an adult policy and €500 on a child policy. Okay, so regardless of the, the value of your premium, you know, it is limited to €1,000 per adult policy. The P35L has an entry for employers to record the amount of medical insurance that is eligible for tax relief for all the individual employees of um, a medical insurance benefit in kind. And the tax credit will be granted by revenue on the employee's tax credit certificate. Okay, so when the employees are paying the um, health insurance premium themselves, they're getting the benefit of the tax relief at source. But as you can see there, where the employer is paying the health insurance, that tax relief at source has been refunded to revenue, and it's granted to the employees then um, on their tax credit certificate. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so sometimes an employer may only pay part of an employee's medical insurance premium. Usually the employer will pay the total net premium to the insurer and recover the employee's contribution as a deduction from the employee's net pay through payroll. Okay, um, and the employer will pay the appropriate amount of TRS to revenue and operate benefit in kind on the gross value of the premium that they have funded. So the gross value of the premium funded by the employer. So in the example here on screen, you can see that the total premium is 2,000 euros and the employer is paying 1,200 euros of that, or in other words, they're paying 60%. Okay? So the TRS, or the tax relief at source, is capped at 1,000 euros, which is the limit for an adult policy, and this has to be apportioned between the employer and the employee. So because the employer is paying 60% of the policy, the TRS is split likewise, so the TRS is split between the employer and the employee at a rate of 60% and 40%. So in this example, you can see the employee um, is getting the benefit of the TRS on their portion, so they're getting 40% of the TRS, um, which is 200 euros, so the TRS is split there between the employer 60% and 40% for the employee, so it's 120 euros and 80 euros. Okay, so because it's capped at 20% of the 1,000, the total TRS is 200 euros and it's split there accordingly, the 60% and 40%. The employee will then claim or receive a tax credit of 120 euros, um, equaling the TRS that the employer has paid to revenue. Okay, now, uh, medical insurance can be one of those ones that um, I suppose can cause a little bit of confusion. Um, you know, and as you will now know, that employers are responsible for 
entering the amount that's eligible for tax relief onto the P35. So it's just another duty, I suppose, at the end of the year. Okay, so we'll move on then just to talk about preferential loans. So a preferential loan is a loan made to an employee or the spouse of an employee where no interest is payable or the rate of interest payable is at a rate lower than revenue specified rate. So PAYE, USC and PRSI um, are due on the difference, uh, to be applied on the difference between the amount of interest paid or payable and the amount of interest that would have been payable if subject to the specified rate, so i.e. the interest saving. So the current specified rates are set out by revenue are 4% for qualifying home loans and 13.5% for all other loans. So if an employee is given a loan and it's considered to be a qualifying home loan, if they're not charged any interest on that loan, well then the interest saving or the benefit kind, if you like, is 4% of the value of the loan. So it's the interest that they have saved, the saving versus revenue specified rate and the rate of interest of any that the employee is charging them employer, sorry, is charging. But if, for example, the employer gives a loan and they're charging the employee the 4% and it's a qualifying home loan, then there is no interest saving because the rate of interest being charged by the employer and revenue specified rate are one and the same. Okay, so it's always on the interest saving. Okay, okay um, so just to speak then about free or subsidized accommodation, so where an employee is provided with free or subsidised accommodation, it is a taxable benefit in kind and as such subject to PAYE, PRSI and USC. The notional value of the benefit in kind is the market value of rent payable um, and this is where the tenant pays expenses, for example, light and heat. But if the employer pays these expenses, a benefit in kind arises um, for the expenses in addition to the rent payable. If it is not possible to determine the market value of the rent payable, revenue um, sorry, assess the annual value of the benefit in kind as being 8% of the market value of the property. Um, alternatively, an employer can obtain a statement from a local estate agent of the market value of the rent payable on the property. Um, in certain circumstances, free or subsidised accommodation is an exempt benefit. So I should just say, where you do receive um, something from a local estate agent, it's certainly worthwhile keeping that on record, because once you can prove where you got that figure from, you know, then revenue are not going to have an issue with it. So just to look then, sorry, um, at the free or subsidised accommodation, for you know, where it's an exempt benefit in kind. Um, so one example of that would be student nurses. Um, an employee that is required to live on the premises to enable the employee to properly perform their duties. So an example of this might be a full-time caretaker. Um, now that exemption does not apply to a director. Okay, so it's an employee required to live on the premises. Um, it doesn't extend to a director. Or accommodation at a temporary workplace which is subject to conditions. Okay, but on the whole free or subsidised accommodation is a taxable benefit in kind. Okay, so we move, move on then just to look at creche or childcare facilities. Um, an employer provided childcare um, facility is a taxable benefit in kind. The taxable benefit is the cost to the employer of providing the facilities, excluding the cost of acquisition. Um, so this includes the light and heat, electricity, wages, insurance, etc. So the taxable benefit should then be apportioned between all the employees availing of the facilities. Prior to 2011, no taxable benefit arose from free or subsidised childcare facilities by employers for their employees, subject to certain terms and conditions. So this was a change, um, you know, the, there was a way of not having that as a benefit in kind um, prior to 2011. If an employer is paying an independent facility for employees' childcare, the taxable benefit in kind is simply the cost to the employer. Okay. Okay, so we mentioned then that we would cover um, exempt benefits. Um, there isn't a huge amount of them, so I mean it's worthwhile, um, you know, I suppose availing of this, you know, where, it's, um, where it suits, you know, employers' requirements. 
Um, so an employer can provide one medical checkup per year, which is not regarded as a taxable benefit. Um, also, medical checkups which employees are regard or sorry are required to undergo by their employer are not taxable benefits. Employers can provide sports and recreational facilities on the employer's own premises, and provided the facilities are made available to all employees, it is an exempt benefit in kind. So for most of these, the important thing is they must be made available to all employees for it to be an exempt benefit. You know, if it's only available to a select few, then unfortunately it would be a benefit in kind. So that's key to uh, most of these. So car parking facilities provided for employees are not a taxable benefit in kind. Okay. Um, and Christmas parties or a special occasion meals or any other events like that, such as a sports day maybe for the staff, um, are not a benefit in kind provided the expenses incurred are reasonable. Um, so I'm not sure how you'd argue the reasonable case, um, but provided uh, they're deemed to be reasonable expenses, then they're an exempt, you know, they're exempt from benefit in kind. Um, employers can provide a new bike and associated equipment to an employee or director who agrees to use the bike to travel to work and a taxable benefit in kind will not arise. Now an alternative to this is the salary sacrifice scheme, which we will look at um, shortly. The provision of monthly or annual bus or train passes by an employer to an employer or director is not a taxable benefit in kind. And again, another alternative to that is to use the salary sacrifice scheme. Um, refunds of course or exam fees to an employee um, or the direct payment of course or exam fees by the employer are not a taxable benefit provided the course is relevant to the business of the employer. Okay. Um, so there would have to be some link between the course um, the employee was undertaking and the line of business that the employer is in. Also, a taxable benefit will not arise when an employer pays a subscription to a professional body on behalf of an employee or reimburses the employee for the subscription if the membership, again, is relevant to the employer's business. Okay? So there's terms and conditions for these. You know, they have to be deemed to be business related. Okay, um, so just some more exempt benefits there. An employer can provide an employee with a laptop or a desktop computer for business use and no tax for benefit will arise. And um, Once it's clear to revenue that, that the provision was for business purposes, they will be happy that any private use is merely incidental. The same applies to a broadband connection or a mobile phone, etc. An employee can also be reimbursed for actual expend expenditure incurred, including the relevant proportion of line rental in respect of business use of a private telephone line or personal mobile, and records should be kept you know, for inspection by revenue. It is important for anything that you know, the records are there to back up um, I suppose the treatments that you have undertaken for any payments or benefits. If an employee has two phones in their home and one is provided for by the employer for business use, no benefit in kind will arise in respect of the costs associated with this phone, um, which are paid by the employer. So just in relation to a debit or credit card then, um, which is provided to the employee by the employer, no benefit of kind will arise provided it is used for business purposes only. Okay. So you might say it's not a benefit if you can't use it, but <laughs> um, that's the rule. Um, if an employee uses the card for private purposes, so if they purchase something you know, for private use on the card, um, and the costs are not reimbursed to the employer, then the cost incurred by the employer is a taxable benefit of kind for the employee. So if the employee does purchase something on the card, either maybe by mistake, they've used the wrong card, or you know, just that, I suppose... Um, they needed to, provided they pay it back, you know, it's not a benefit of kind, but if there's a personal charge on the card which isn't reimbursed, then it is a taxable benefit in kind. There is no taxable benefit in kind for free or subsidised meals in a staff canteen, provided the facility, again, is made available to all employees, and that is so important. Okay. Um, a cash award made to an employee in recognition of passing an examination or of acquiring a qualification, which bears some relationship to his or her duties, should be regarded as not assessable, provided the award is of, is of such an amount that can reasonably be regarded as reimbursement of expenses likely to have been incurred in studying and sitting for the examination. 
Okay, so that can be a cash reward, so that's quite um, unusual, um, but it has to be seen, you know, as reasonably being regarded as reimbursement of the of expenses incurred. Okay. So just to move on then to talk about e-workers. Um, so e-workers are employees that work from home. And employers can provide these employees with equipment, for example, a laptop, printer, software, you know, fax machine, etc., um, to enable them to work from home. And employers can provide items that are pr primarily used for business purposes, and there will be no benefit in kind. So this is just equipment that's um, required in order to um, facilitate them working from home. Telephone line broadband, etc., installed for business use will not give rise to a benefit in kind. Um, other equipment, for example, office furniture provided to enable working from home, again, there's no benefit in kind, so this is all, I suppose, the setup costs. Okay. Um, and revenue work recognise that e-workers will incur a certain expenditure in the performance of their duties from home, such as additional heating, electricity costs. So revenue will allow employers to make payments up to 320 per day to employees without deducting PAYE, PRSI or USC. Okay, so this is for, for e-workers, so they're working from home, and um, you can pay them up to 320, 3 euros 20 per day um, as a tax-free payment. So it's just simply seen to be something towards, you know, the additional expenditure they incur by working from home. Now, this does not prevent an employee making a specific expenses claim where the actual expenditure incurred is in excess of this amount. Okay. And again, like everything else, records of payments made must be retained by the employer for the purpose of a revenue audit. Okay. okay. So just to look then at the cycle to work scheme by way of a salary sacrifice. So salary sacrifice um, operates by the employee for going part of their salary to cover the associated cost. Okay. By foregoing part of their salary, they're saving on PAYE, PRSI, and USC. And the employer also saves on the employer's PRSI. Um, so in relation to the cycle to work scheme, which we will now cover, the salary sacrifice arrangement or agreement must be complete over a maximum of 12 months. So it's a maximum term of 12 months to complete the salary sacrifice arrangement for a bike-to-work scheme. Under the scheme, the employer must purchase the bike. The exemption does not apply where the employee purchases the bike and gets reimbursed by the employer. Again, that's extremely important. You know, the employer has to be the one purchasing and paying for the bike. Um, they can't reimburse the employee for the bike. They must purchase it. Um, you know, the employer must make that purchase. Um, there must be a bona fide and enforceable alteration to the terms and conditions of employment, exercising a choice of benefit instead of a salary. Okay? The scheme can only be availed of once in a five-year period, and unfortunately if a bike is stolen or anything like that, it's still very strict, you know, once in a five-year period. Um, and employers cannot claim the VAT back, sorry, the VAT back on the bicycle. Okay? So just some pointers there on the cycle to work. Um, by way of a salary sacrifice. So if, for example, employees paid 500 euros per week and the salary sacrifice arrangement then is, you know, they're foregoing 50 euros per week, their pay then, you know, for the duration of the um, bike to work scheme with the agreement, um, subject to PAYE, PRSI and USC, will be on 450 euros. So their pay subject to those taxes has been decreased by the agreed salary sacrifice of 50 euros. And as mentioned, um, the employer then has a saving as well because the employer PRSI is on the 450 euros instead of the, you know, the, if you like, the old salary of 500 euros. Okay. Okay. So just to look then at the long service award, um, a taxable benefit does not arise in respect of long service awards where certain conditions are met. The award must mark a long service of not less than 20 years. So, I mean, it really is a long service. <laughs> um, it must be a tangible, a tangible article of reasonable cost. The cost cannot exceed 50 euros per year of service, and no similar, similar award can have been made in the previous five years. 
Okay? The treatment does not apply to rewards made in cash or in the form of vouchers, etc. So it literally is a gift, you know, use the gold watch there in the um, image on the presentation. Um, so, you know, it can't be cash or a voucher. It's a gift, a watch, I don't know, a clock, whatever, you know, something to that effect. Um, but the service has to be more than 20 years and you can't have given an, a similar award in the previous five years. Okay. And just to recap there, you know, the value or the reward, the, the gift, it cannot exceed 50 euro per year of service. Okay. Okay, so we move on there just to look at this small benefit exemption scheme. So under the small benefit exemption scheme, an employer can provide an employee or director with a small benefit, that is a voucher or a benefit, um, it's a tangible asset, something other than cash, with a value not exceeding 500 euros, um, and PAY, PRSI and USC don't apply. Okay, so the, under the small benefit scheme, there is no charge to PAY, USC or PRSI. Now, only one such benefit can be given in one tax year, where there is more than one benefit, subsequent um, benefits have to be taxed, even if the combined value is under the threshold, okay? So, very strict, it's one per tax year, um, so for, if you look at the um, threshold there, 500 euros, like if you gave 10 vouchers for 50 euros, unfortunately, nine of those vouchers are subject to benefit of a kind. Um, so some companies, I think, operate where my, whereby maybe if they do rewards of you know 50 euros, for example, you know maybe they get um, like a token if you like, and then they cash them in, I suppose, at the end, or not cash them, voucher them in. Um, so it's one benefit per tax year. Okay. Now, unfortunately, if the benefit exceeds the threshold, the full value is subject to PAY, USC, and PRSI. So if you were to give an employer, or, sorry, an employee, a voucher, for example, for 510 euros. Unfortunately, the 510 euros is subject to benefit in kind. Um, the benefit cannot form part of a salary sacrifice scheme, okay? And the most popular use of the small benefit scheme would be, as, you know, to, for employers to give a voucher at Christmas time. So that's when most employers would avail of the small benefit scheme. So the, the threshold was 250 euros and that was increased um, just at the end of 2015. So it was a big increase to go from 250 euros up to 500 euros. Okay. But just um, you need to be very, you know, the rules are the value cannot exceed 500 euros. It cannot be cash. If it's cash, it's fully taxable. Again, only one such benefit can be given in one tax year. Um, it doesn't have to be used for the first benefit, you know, if, for example, an employee gets a voucher of 100 euros in January, but there's a voucher to come for 400 euros later on, you know, it can be used for the latter one once it's only used once within a tax year. Um, and very important just to stress there again that the, the benefit cannot form part of a salary sacrifice scheme. Okay. Um, so just looking at pensions then, um, employer contributions to retirement benefit scheme, uh, pension, are not a taxable benefit in kind. And although employer contributions to a PRSA are seen to be a taxable benefit in kind, they qualify for full tax relief subject to the age-related limits. Um, so, you know, they cancel each other out if you like. Um, the contributions therefore are not subject to PAYE or PRSI. So this is the employer contribution. Um, and from the 1st of January 2016, employer contributions to PRSAs are no longer subject to USC. Prior to this, employer contributions to PRSAs were subject to USC in the employee hands. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just to recap, um, an employer contribution to any of the uh, pensions, um, you know, there's no... Um, sorry, there's, there's no... Um, so I can't think of my words. <laughs> uh, they're, just, they're not subject to PAY, USC, or PRSI, but just to note the difference there that prior to this year there was um, a USC implication for PRSA pensions only. Okay. Okay, um, so just to look then at the benefit and kind employer revenue returns. Um, so all form P60s and P35Ls completed by employers um, show the combined value of employees' wages and salary, you know, wages, salary, and notional pay for any benefit and kind received. 
So the taxable gross, if you like, on the P60s and P35L would include the benefit in kind, you know, the notional pay figure. So for anybody receiving a benefit in kind, their pay on their P60 and P35 are more than their actual salary, you know, because they're including the benefit in kind. The P35 LF um, that you, you know, as part of the P35 return reports the total taxable benefits figure for all employees as well as specific information in relation to medical insurance. Um, it also reports pension information, so that is the pension products in use um, within the company, the number of employees contributing, the value of the contributions, etc. Okay. Uh, now, very recently, in fact, last week, uh, we have learned that the P35L for 2017 would include two additional fields for employees. Um, so one is share-based remuneration, and the second um, new monetary field on the P35L for 2017 is a taxable benefits field at employee level. So currently, as I said, the P35LF reports the total taxable benefits figure for all employees within the company. Um, it will be from 2017, um, a tax for benefits figure for each employee as well at the employee level. And on top of that, if there's any medical insurance there, you'll have specific fields then for the, um, you know, the medical insurance subject or sub subject, sorry, eligible for tax relief. <laughs> get the right words today. Um, any employer that receives a P11D um, is obliged to complete the P11D and include all benefits provided to the employees and benefit and kind records should be retained for a period of six years. Okay. I think it's quite rare for employers to get P11Ds but you know um, in a situation where you do receive the P11D you um, are obliged to complete it. If you don't get it, you don't need to do anything. There's no, you know, nothing to be done there. Okay. Uh, thanks, Vicky, <coughs> for joining me again. <laughs> Hopefully, I won't be stumbling over my words now. <laughs> no problem. Um, so, hopefully, that's given you some food for thought. Um, so, that just ends the presentation there. Um, we do have a couple of minutes spared there. So, if you do have any questions, if you want to just type them into your question. Box that over on your control panel at the right hand side of the screen. We'll just give you a couple of seconds there if you do have a question. We'll just see if anything comes in. As mentioned at the very beginning as well, we will send on the PowerPoint slides and also a recording of the presentation today so you can watch it back um, at your convenience again. So we'll just see if there's any questions coming in. It's like you're off the hook, Audrey, not yeah. to <laughs> No questions today. No, I think we're, we're pretty much, yeah. yeah, yeah, so there's no questions coming in there, um, so yeah, so thank you very much everybody for joining us today, um, if you do have any questions there, um, please do give us a call, um, yeah, you can email as well, email as well, Audrey at tesaurus.ie or Vicky at tesaurus.ie, okay, yeah, I'll yeah. get back to you on anything there, okay, thanks very much now, thanks. many thanks, bye bye. -bye.